right, let's go and get our Bibles, please, and let's open up to John chapter number 14. We are planning on finishing John chapter 14 today. John chapter number 14. Last week, we looked at a very important concept of what peace is. Because the Lord Jesus Christ, if you rem- well, let's remind ourselves of where we're at with this, the Lord Jesus Christ is only a few hours away from going to the cross of Calvary. And once he goes to the cross of Calvary, he is going to leave this earth, and then he is going to come back in the resurrected Christ, with his new body, the resurrected body, the glorified body. He is going to make appearances for the next 40 days after that resurrection, and then he is going to ascend into heaven, all right? And then he's seated at the right hand of the Father until the millennial kingdom takes place where he comes back to this earth to rule and reign for a thousand years. Now, we're not at that position yet. We are waiting for that to happen. So it's been close to almost uh, 1970 years since the Lord Jesus Christ rose again from the dead or ascended into heaven. And so we are waiting for this time. So there's been a wide gap over 1900 years where the Lord Jesus Christ has not physically appeared to anyone or physically come to this earth. And so he told his disciples, hey, don't let your hearts be troubled, okay? Stop, stop stressing out. I'm, I'm going to send, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit of God. You're not going to be left alone. You're going to have access to the Father. You are going to be saved. You're, you know, you should be rejoicing because where I am, I'm preparing a place for you, and I'm going to call you unto myself. And he gave us all those lists of great blessings, and the final blessing that he listed for us was the idea that he can give us peace. Look what it says in verse 27. Peace I leave with you, all right? That was his, his, his inheritance to us, you could say. We could have peace with God because the Lord Jesus Christ paid for our sins on the cross of Calvary. And God the Father accepted that uh, payment for our sins. And now if you repent of your sin and put your total trust and faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can have peace with God. And then we also know that we can have the peace of of God now. Because we know the Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior, because the Holy Spirit resides inside of us, because the gift of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is peace, we can go through trials, we can go through situations, we can go through all kinds of things and still have that peace, that calmness, that stillness, that assurance, that confidence in our God and that we're going to get through it and you can weather any storm with that peace. So what a beautiful thing he's going to leave his disciples but also by us by extension. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth. Remember the world's peace is temporary. It's phony. It always has some ulterior motive behind it. But that's not something the Lord did. It's completely different than that. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. And then he says this, and here's where we start our new passage. He says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Why? Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. So that's our passage that we're looking at here. And it's again, it's a time, I'm giving you peace, and now I want you to rejoice. I want you to stop being stressed out. Look what he says at the end of verse 27. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Remember that word troubled has the idea of being agitated. Kind of like a washer, kind of like a bubbling brook. It's just a bunch of bubbles like a boiling pot of water. It's not still on the top. It's agitated. It's aggravated. It's just bubbling over and just a constant stress. You know, unfortunately, there's people today living that way because they're afraid of the COVID or they're afraid of this or they're afraid of that. Look, Jesus Christ came and he doesn't want you to be agitated. Remember when they were living, they were underneath that Roman oppression. They didn't have a U.S. Constitution to help protect their rights. They were under the dominance and the hatred of the Roman government. All right, And they had to put up with that. They were also enslaved to a certain part through that government. They weren't allowed to have arms. They weren't allowed to do the things that we can do in our country right now. And yet Jesus Christ tells them, 
Stop being aggravated. Stop being agitated. Let not your heart. He's imploring them. He's saying you're in a state right now that your heart is agitated, and you can understand why. Jesus said he's getting ready to leave. We, we've talked about that. A lot of stuff going on. And, you know, Peter was just seen to be the, uh, he's going to deny Christ three times. Judas has left to betray. they got all these things going on that's going in their mind. They're, they're agitated. They're aggravated. They're, they're scared. And so Christ says, no, 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 no. I don't want you to be afraid. I have not, we find out in the Word of God that God does not give us the spirit of fear. We have nothing to fear. And that's why he says that next. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. Afraid simply means to be timid. Afraid means to be scared. Afraid means to be fearful, which means full of fear. God never intended or wanted any of us to be full of fear. That's not God's intent for our lives. He wants us to be of love and of sound mind and of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He doesn't want us to be fearful. He doesn't want us to be agitated or aggravated. Matter of fact, this is the second time that night the Lord Jesus Christ stated this. Keep your finger, just go back a page perhaps to chapter 14, verse number 1. Remember how the Lord Jesus started this conversation? Remember how he started this topic? He says, let not your heart be troubled. He said the same thing. That's exactly what he said in the last verse we just read at the end of verse 27. But there was a different reason. Here in verse number 1 he says, you believe in God, believe also in me. All right, You trust God to take care of it, but now make sure you trust me because this is what I'm going to do for you, right? I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I am not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going, I'm going to keep open that prayer opportunity. I'm going to send the, I'm going to pray God that he sends the Holy Spirit to you. So Jesus Christ said, you believed in God, trust in me the same way. Put the same faith that you've had in God into me. And remember, that's what he says. He continues on. Uh, Verse number two, in my Father's house where God dwells are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, and that's again that assumed to be true, and since I go, there's no question whether he's going or not. Since I go and prepare a place for you, he promises I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go to where I go, you know, which we know is he's going to heaven. He's going to be with the Father. And the way you know, and then we covered all that where Philip answers, we don't know the way, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and we understood Christ responding to that. But the reason why I come to verse number one is because Jesus Christ has the same basic idea in verses 27 and 28 of why we should not be afraid. Why we should not be agitated. Why we should not be troubled in our lives. He said, you believe in God, believe in me. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to bring you back to myself. That's the same idea that he has here. Look what he says, and that's why the context of this chapter is important for when we get to the end of this verse. He says, uh, end of verse 27, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away. Well, where is he going to go away? Well, of course. He is getting ready in the next few hours to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. He is going to be betrayed by Judas. He's going to get mock trials and faulty religious trials and faulty civil trials. He is going to be accused of absolutely nothing but falsehoods. And he's going to go to the he's going to get scourged. He's going to go to the cross of Calvary. He is literally going to die on that cross, and they're going to place him in a tomb. So the Lord says, I'm going away. I, I am going away. All right, I'm going to die and I'm leaving. All right, that's the closest that we know. I go away, but then he adds, and come again unto you. So, this could mean I'm going away, the death, burial, and resurrection, or death, burial, and I'm going to come again unto you. That's when the Lord Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, right? And he came back in his glorified body and he presented himself to his disciples for 40 days. And then after those 40 days, he went up to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. That's what this could mean. But the other application could mean this, that when he says, I go away, that could include the death, burial, resurrection, all the way through to the ascension. 
where we're at right now. From the time when the Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven until he returns in the millennial kingdom. He could be referring to that space of time as well. He could be referring to both of them. The Bible's not exactly clear which one to take that as. But either one is true. Right now, the Lord Jesus Christ has gone away. He is not physically here on this earth. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I. That is the reason why He has sent the Holy Spirit, so that when we trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, like He promised, the Holy Spirit now comes and lives inside of us. And since the Holy Spirit is God, Christ resides in us, the Father resides in us, in the person of the Holy Spirit of God. All right? So that's what he's get, that's possibly what he could be getting to. He's gone away, and then he will come again, meaning the millennial kingdom, right? When he literally comes back. So both these topics could be discussed here. I'm not exactly sure which one it is, but the fact simply is that I think it's specifically speaking about the resurrection. That's mine because of the rest of the context, but I do allow for the other aspect too that makes sense. Because look what he says. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away. And come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. What is he talking about here? Well, he uses the if ye love me, and that again is not, it is not since you love me. All right, that is not assumed to be true. It is based on a relationship. If you love me. Now, incorporated in this understanding of if you love me, implies trust, implies belief. Remember how he started off verse number 1 and 2 and 3 in, in, in John 14, where he said, you believe in God, you know, don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That's basically what he's saying. If you love me, if you trust me, if you hope in me, if you believe in me, if you put your confidence in me, all right, this is what's going to happen. If you love me, if you are devoted to me and the things that I teach and the things that I say, he says this, if you love me, ye would rejoice. It's the natural outcome of trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, of putting your faith in Him rather than your situation, rather than your circumstance. When you trust in God, when you display your love for Him by trusting Him, believing in Him, counting on Him, hoping in Him, you're going to rejoice. And that's what He says here. If you love me, you would rejoice. A Christian's life should be filled with rejoicing. Not stress, not depression, not agitation, not fear, but rejoicing. Why? Why would we rejoice if the Lord Jesus Christ is leaving? Well, this is what he says next. You have heard I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice. Why? Because, remember in our Bible studies, Watch for those words. It's showing the cause. Because I said, I go unto the Father. That's exactly parallel to what the Lord Jesus Christ was saying in verses 1 through 4, where he basically said, I go to my Father's house, and in my Father's house there are many mansions, right? Or there, there are many dwellings there, and I go to prepare a place for you. Right, And if I, if I do go there, I am going to come back to you. So you should be happy. You should be rejoicing. And if there's anything that you can rejoice in once you know Christ is your Savior, is that this world is not your home. Look at how crazy this world is today. Look how insane this world is turning just because some COVID virus. And if you think that that is why we are isolated, if you think that's why the, the economy is falling apart, it's not. It's all about the globalism. It's all about the socialists. It's all about the humanistic view of the world. This is where the two worlds are colliding today. You have the biblical world, and you have what the world is offering, the humanism, the socialism, the liberalism, and how it's just trying to take over things. They're trying to scare you. Look at the difference between the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants you to rejoice. He wants you to live. He wants you to have an abundant life. He wants you to be happy and excited because this world's not your home. How does this world want you to live? In fear, in bondage, no freedom. Can't make up your own choices. You can't eat what you want to eat. You can't go where you want to go. You can't talk to whom you want to talk to. You can't take risks if the government doesn't want you to. This world is not your home, and praise God it's not. 
Well, I, can you just imagine what your life would be like if you thought all that there was what this world had to offer? This world has nothing to offer. It has pain, it has fear, it has lusts, it has abuses, it has all kinds of filth and foolishness. If this world was all that there was to be, I don't know anyone that's going to be rejoicing, unless you're the one with the big bucks, unless you're the one that's calling the shots. There's no way you're going to be rejoicing. So Christ says, look, I don't want you to be stressed out. I don't want you to be agitated. I don't want you to be fearful. I want you to... Rejoice, because I go to my Father. There's another place out there. There's another realm, the spiritual realm, the heavenly realm, the eternal realm, God's realm, where sin has not been defiling, where sin does not have any control over, where man and his humanism and his foolishness is not going to be in control. But God's laws and God's love and God's presence is going to overrule in every aspect up there. Sin will not stay in his sight. And that's where you have to understand the next part of this verse. I know a lot of cultists love taking this verse out of its context. And they love to say, especially the Jehovah false witnesses that are out there, and the Mormons that are out there, and sometimes Seventh-day Adventists and others. There are many cults out there that use this verse to show that Jesus Christ is not God. And they'll pull this verse out of its context and say, See, even Jesus said that He is less than the Father. That the Father is greater than Him. Look what He says. He says, you would rejoice because I said unto you, I go unto the Father. Why? There's that little word for there. It's explaining cause again. For my Father is greater than I. Now, if you have some smooth-talking individual, they can try and tell you that the Father greater than I means that Jesus Christ is less than the Father. And they would take it this way, like the Jehovah false witnesses will do. They say that God the Father, Jehovah, created His Son, Jesus Christ. Where Jesus Christ still retained enough God powers to go ahead and to finish off creation, but He still is not Almighty God. He is a God. He is a lesser God. He is Michael the Archangel, because the word Michael means who is like God. And so God created Jesus first, and then Jesus did all these other things. Or He could have it where the the... Mormons believe along those lines as well that Jesus is not God. He is the Elohim of this world. He was just a man. He was a brother with Satan himself. That Lucifer and Jesus were brothers. And that God, Elohim, uh, chose Jesus' plan to save Elohim's world rather than Satan's plan or Lucifer's plan. And that's why we have this constant struggle. There's a lot of foolishness out there that are always trying to put Jesus less than God. And this is their favorite verse, but when you keep it in its context, especially comparing it to verses 1 through 4, you note that when he's saying the Father is greater than I, he is not teaching that Jesus is less than God. I mean, think about it. Even in this passage, what did he already tell Philip? If you've, all, if you've seen me, you've seen who? God the Father. He's already said that I and my Father are One, he said, if you can't believe that I'm God, I do the works of the Father. The same exact works that the Father does, I do. The same words that the Father speaks, I speak. Jesus Christ is always claiming, all through the Word of God, He is claiming to be God in the flesh. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. No one can claim that. I and the Father are one. You can go on and on. Every miracle that He did, He claimed to be God. God. He showed his authority as God. So then what does he mean here that his father is greater than him? Well, the context speaks of it. Well, I, 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 before I jump into that, I, wanna, I forgot to say this, that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are in one essence, one nature, one character, and share one attribute because they are God. All right. So now when he says the Father is greater than I, why can he make that statement? Well, it's simple. He was saying that, well, let's go here. Take your Bibles, go to Philippians chapter 2. I know I spend a lot of times in Philippians chapter 2, but that helps us understand the correlation of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to a certain degree. All right. 
Philippians chapter number 2, we studied this a number of times, so I won't go through it too detailed. But this is how the Father is greater than the Son. Excuse me. In Philippians chapter number 2, verses 5 on down, Paul is addressing an issue in the church between two ladies that were fighting and causing disunity in the church. He said, Let this mind be in you, which, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, being in the form of God means that he's the express image of God. It means everything that you think of God, as revealed in the word of God, is, that's who Jesus Christ is as well. And so he says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now there's none of us that would say, I am God, or I am equal to God. We would be speaking blasphemy. We'd be speaking all kinds of foolishness. But Jesus Christ thought it was not robbery to claim that he was God, or that he was equal to God. Matter of fact, he said, you have to, the Father said, you've got to honor the Son the same way you honor the Father. And so he thought it's not robbery. What is robbery? Taking something that's not yours. That's robbery. Jesus didn't take anything from the Father when he said, I am equal with God, or that I am God, or that you don't have to honor me as you honor God, because he is God. All right, So that sets the, the tone right off the top of the bat that Jesus Christ is God. But here is the distinction. But made himself, Jesus made himself of no reputation. We talked about that. That means he emptied himself. It means when he was up in eternal glory, in eternity past, in perfect harmony with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they were in perfect unity in everything. But what he decided to do, what Jesus decided to do, not the Father didn't do this. The Father had the plan, but Jesus carried it out. Jesus emptied himself. And it says here, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Just as he is in the likeness of God, which means he's 100% God, he was made in the likeness of man, meaning he's 100% man. We can't fully understand that. It's called the hypostatic union, if you ever hear some big theological term. It simply means that he had two natures. He was God and man 100% at the same exact time. Something we can't fully comprehend, but that's what the Word of God teaches, so I'm going to believe it. And so he was 100% God, 100% man. The Father never, ever came to this earth in the form of a man. The Father never submitted himself to come to this vile earth to do what Jesus Christ did. He says here in verse number 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. What a humbling it is. For God, though it's the second person in the Godhead, for God to humble himself and become a man. To literally come to this earth which he created among the people which whom he created, and allow them to spit in his face, to allow them to lie about him, and to cheat, and to beat, and to bruise, and to mock, and to do all the insults and everything else. The Lord Jesus Christ willingly did that for you and for me. And being found as a fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. So you can see that the Lord Jesus Christ, in his position, though he is 100% God, he humbled himself, he came to this earth, he died for you and me, he rose again. The Father never did that. The Father never left eternal glory. The Father never had sin placed upon him. The Father never had that. But the Son did. It was the Son who had to cry out when He took on your sin and my sin. My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? The Father never had to do that. The Father was always in heaven. That is how the Father is greater. He's never been tainted with sin. He never had to experience the sin of man. He never came down into this sin-cursed world and became flesh and allowed them to brutally murder Him. The Father never did that. He never left heaven's glory. And so that's why Jesus Christ says, you should be rejoicing. Because I told you, I'm going away, but you know where I'm going? I'm going to the Father, where it's never been tainted with sin, where it's never been stained, where the Father had never had to come on down to to be brutally murdered and to humble himself. He remained God, the sovereign God, though Jesus did too, but remember, he willingly gave up certain attributes so that he could, uh, gave up certain expression of those attributes. He was still 100% God so that he could die for you 
and for me. That's what it means that the Father is, or that the Son, or the Father is greater than Son. Let me see what I wrote. The Father never left heaven's glory. The Father never humbled himself to be a man. The Father never became obedient or subjected himself to death. The Father never died on the cross. The Father remained in heaven's glory, completely set apart from man and his vile sin. Therefore, the disciples should rejoice because the Father, who remained untainted by vile humanity, has accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sins so that we can get to heaven. That's what he means when he says the Father is greater than I. I have on this board, maybe I should have explained it first before I jumped into this, but on this board I drew it out this way. The purple outline shows God. There is one God, G-O-D, there is only one God the Word of God talks about. But that God manifests himself in three persons. Now here's a problem. A lot of people do, does not, do not understand what persons is. Whenever you think of a person, most people think of you and I, human beings. They are persons. That's not the definition of a person. The definition of a person means you have three things that you have. You have a definition of person. Number one means that you are self-conscious. You have an aware of your own existence. I am aware of how I function. I am aware of my own existence. I am aware that I exist and how I interact with things around me. That is a person, is someone that is self-conscious. Number two, a person is someone that has a will. I can determine what I would like to do. I'm not doing it based on instincts, but I can think through things, and I know that when I make a decision, number three, third, third thing about a person is that they understand that they affect the world around them. That's the definition of what a person is. They are self-conscious, they have a will, and they know how their actions, or they can understand that their actions affects everyone and the world around them. That is the definition of a person. That is why dogs are not people. That is why cats are not people, or chimpanzees, or monkeys, or dolphins are not people. They do not have a self-conscious awareness. They do not understand that when they pick up that stick and they swing it around, how it affects the world around them. They do not not have a will. They do not sit back and say, should I do this or should I not do that? Look, if I go ahead and bite my master's hand, he's never going to feed me again. No, you train them. You teach them. You have to train animals in that fashion. They don't understand. Just go on YouTube and, and look at animal funny animals. And you'll see that they have no clue what's going on. You'll have cats look at another cat inside a window or inside a mirror. And what does it do? It has no self-consciousness. It doesn't know that that's just a reflection of itself. It jumps at it. It fights it. It runs away. Same thing with a dog. Same thing with any type of animal. Because they don't have any self-awareness. They have no self-consciousness. They don't understand how their will and their decisions affect things as a whole. But we all do that as people. That's why being created in the image of God, one of the ways are, is that we are made persons. And that's why people call human beings persons. Right? But you got to understand what that definition is. So it doesn't mean that you have a physical body. God the Father does not have a physical body. No one has ever seen him. He is a spirit, and yet he is still a person because he is self-aware of what he does. He does have a will, and he knows how it affects the things around him. Jesus Christ, though he took on flesh, is still a person. All right? He is a person. He has a will, he has self-awareness, and he knows how things affect him. The Holy Spirit is a person. You're never going to see the Holy Spirit. You're never going to feel the Holy Spirit. None of those things are going to want. The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. He's a spirit, and you're never going to understand. You're never going to uh, see him. Doesn't mean that he's not a person. The Holy Spirit has a will, a self-awareness, and a consciousness how things work around. So when I talk about God being in three persons, doesn't mean that he has three physical human forms. And that's what confuses a lot of people. The Father is still a person. Now the Father's job, of course, is to be supreme. That's his job. He comes up with all the plans. If from eternity future, it's his counsel, his will that's going to be done. When Jesus Christ came to this earth, when he came to this earth, he said, I'm here to do my Father's will. Not my own. I'm here to do the Father's will, do whatever the Father's want. Speaks the Father's words from the commandments of he, from the commandments that He's given me. I've done it all. You see, the Father has planned it. Creation. The Father didn't create anything. He planned it all. It was the Son who is the intermediate agency. He's the one that came to earth. He's the one that took on flesh. 
He is still God. He came in the flesh. He's still God. But he carried out the Father's plans. He's the intermediate agency. He's the one that did the creation. He is the one that provided for salvation. That's what Jesus did. All right? He is still God. He's still omnipresent. He's still omniscient. He's still everything that God is. He shares the same nature. He's holy, holy, holy. He has the same wraths. Everything that God is, Jesus is. But he had a different role. His role was to be submissive to the Father, to be dependent upon the Father, to not, to not act independently of the Father, and to provide salvation for you and me. That's why he humbled himself. He's still God. And he became obedient to death. But he's subservient to the Father. And then you have the Holy Spirit. He is still a person, but his job is to glorify Christ and to point to Christ. He's in submission to Christ. All right? Doesn't mean he's any less of an individual. It doesn't mean he's any less God or any less of a person. It's just his role in the Godhead. You have the Father plans it all. The Son who carries it out through the power and ministry of the Holy Spirit of God, which is going to glorify Jesus Christ, which ultimately glorifies God the Father. And that's why I get a lot of problem with some of these charismatic fellows, because they end up glorifying the Holy Spirit more than they glorify the Son. The Holy Spirit never came, and we'll see that later on in chapter 15 and 16. He never came to glorify Himself. He doesn't want anything at all. He doesn't want to be in the limelight at all. He simply wants to glorify the Son. He wants to woo people to the Son. He wants to illumine their minds to their understanding of the Son. All right? So here we have God. There is one God in three persons. Okay? So this is how the Father, he had the supreme plan for the Lord Jesus Christ to come down. He never left heaven. And that's why Jesus Christ said, if you loved me, if you trusted me, if you believed in me, you're going to rejoice because I go to the Father. And he's never been tainted by sin. And then you go to verses 1 through 4, and he has many dwelling places. He has many mansions. And I'm going to prepare a place just for you so that where I am, you can come also. So you and I should be rejoicing that in our relationship with Christ, like I've said millions of times before, they can take everything away from you. Your health, your money, your job, your freedoms, everything away. But they cannot take away your relationship with the Son, being sealed by the Spirit, and having a home in heaven for all eternity when there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth with no more pain, no more suffering, no more sadness, no more sickness. We'll get our glorified bodies. We'll have a mind like Christ. The sin nature will be removed, which is burdening us day in and day out. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ said, if you love me, you would rejoice because I go unto the Father. And the Father is greater than I. He's never left heaven. And that's where I'm going. It's not, man's sin has not tainted. Now there was sin in heaven at the beginning when Satan sinned, when Lucifer sinned, right? And so heaven has been slightly defiled since that point, and that's why God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth, all right? Where there's going to be no sin, no sin at all involved. So you understand that part. But this is what he's talking about here when he says, my father is greater than I. He's not saying he's less than God. That would violate every passage we've talked about so far in the Gospel of John, which is trying to prove that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is God in the flesh, and that believing you could have eternal life. Right? That'd violate every passage. So take it in its context. He said, you're going to rejoice because I go to my Father, and my Father is greater than I in position, not as in power or attribute or nature. They are all equal. All right? Hard concept to understand, but hopefully that helped clear up some things for you. So let's move on a little bit further. He simply says, boy, I, I, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You've heard of how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice. Because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now, boy, we're going to look at some things, how the Word of God can encourage us today. And now I have told you before it come to, excuse me, before it come to pass. Why? That when it is come to pass, ye might believe. The Lord Jesus Christ did not want his disciples going around clueless. He didn't want his disciples to go around in the dark. He said, look, I've told you before what's going to happen. I've given you my word. So that when it does happen, when you find yourself in that situation, my word is going to increase your belief. 
so that you can strengthen your relationship with me is basically what he's saying. He's telling his disciples here that, and now I have told you before it come to pass, I'm God, I know what's happening, this, 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 death, this death, this crucifixion is not something that wasn't in the plan of God from the beginning. I already know what it's going to be. I told you before, I have to give my life for sinful men. I will rise again. You can destroy this temple. Three days I'll raise it up. All through his ministry, I've been telling you this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. So that when it finally does happen, your faith will grow. You will believe. The same thing is true for you and I. The same application is for us. This is why you do not want to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. This is why you don't want to forsake good, solid Bible preaching. This is why you don't want to forsake your daily devotions and your walk with the Lord. Because the Lord wants to train you. The Lord wants to teach you before you get into that trial. He wants you shored up so that when the trial comes, when the situation comes, you will handle it the right way, and then your faith will grow in Christ. But a lot of times, people go through trials, and they're swimming around. They don't know what to do. Then they start panicking and start looking up in the Bible, the Word of God, as they're going all over, and they don't know how to respond. It's because they don't take time to get prepared before it ever happens. Look, you miss a preaching service. Now, I'm not telling you that as a pastor, I'm a mystical being and I have a special relationship with God. I'm not telling you that. I have the same type of relationship that you have with God. I have the same Holy Spirit. I'm not holier than anyone. My prayers don't get answered more than yours. My uh, Bible reading isn't more in-depth than yours. It is all the same. We have the same Holy Spirit of God. It's just that God has given me the gift of a pastor. God has given me the gift of a teacher. And so that way I can disseminate the Word of God and make it clear and, and understandable for people. But I'm not special. I am not something special. I'm just a normal man like you are. Uh, that's exactly what I am. All right? And so the whole I, concept of that is, but when I preach the Word of God and I go through verse by verse and I am accurate, it is the Lord that is firming you up. He's building you up on the faith. He's developing your relationship with Him. And what He has done sometimes is that He will use the preaching of a man of God who is preaching the accurate Word of God to encourage your heart to do something right for God. Maybe He'll use, the Holy Spirit will take the uh, Word of God, the accurate preaching of the Word of God, and call you into missions or call you into some area or do something in your heart. Or get you prepared because God knows that within two weeks you're going to have a trial. You're going to miss a loved one. You're going to have an opportunity to witness to someone. God knows what's going on. So he wants to take the word of God and build you up and strengthen yourself up. But if you miss those services, if you miss that preaching of the word of God out of laziness or foolishness, how's the Lord going to build you up? And then when the trial comes or the situation comes, you don't know how to handle yourself. You don't know how to handle what's going on. And then instead of your faith increasing, you start blaming God and getting mad at God and frustrated at God and, and turning your and getting all bad mouthed and emotional and everything else. The Lord doesn't want you to respond that way. Matter of fact, he told his disciples, I've told you before what's going to happen. All right, this is what's going to happen. Prepare yourself. Don't live in cloud nine. This is what's going to happen. And I'm telling you before it happens, so that when it does happen, your faith may grow rather than backpedal. All right? So the importance of the word of God in our life. Just like for the disciples. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, ye might believe that you will grow stronger in your faith. Verse 30, hereafter I will not talk much with you. Uh, at this point, the Lord's not going to talk much. He is going to have the resurrection. We get a couple pictures of that in the Word of God when he interacted with his disciples. After he interacted with his disciples, he, he, went, he saw them for about 40 days, so that's not much time compared to the three years that they've had. He said, I'm not going to talk much with you because I'm going to be sending up to heaven. And then I'm going. I'm not going to be speaking to you anymore. I'm not going to be physically talking to you anymore. All right? He says, Here, hereafter, I will, not, uh, I, I will not talk much with you. Why? For the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Jesus will be arrested in a few short hours. Satan's hour is coming. Satan has nothing to do with Christ, and that is something that we have to understand as we look at uh, the, this aspect of the Word of God. I'll get to there in a minute. But Satan has absolutely nothing to do with Christ. He is considered the prince and power of the air. 
Satan is, is the one that is in charge of the world system and the world's governments and the world's ideas and humanism. It is that the culture clash between biblical truth and everything else is Satan's area. And Jesus wants to let the disciples know, he has nothing in me. He has no part in this plan. He is not going to deter me from this plan. He is not going to uh, distract me that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to go through with this plan knowing that Satan is going to try and upend it somehow. The world, on, on, on application here, the world has nothing for you as a Christian. Especially in response to the Word of God. The world has nothing to offer you in your spiritual life. Jesus is getting ready to die and physically leave this earth, and Satan, the prince and part of the heir of this world system, has nothing to do with him and has never had anything to do with him. So let me ask you, why do Christians turn to the world for their comfort, for their rejoicing, for their help, for their strength? This world has nothing to do with Christ. He's leaving, but he's given us his Word. He's given us the Holy Spirit. And unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians out there, at least they're supposed Christians, that are duped by what this world has to offer. I am so amazed, just in our own political realm, in our, in our own world, in our own America, how supposed Christians can vote for any liberal at all. How can they do that? They know they're against Israel. They know they want to murder babies. They know they want to do euthanasia. They know they want you to turn into communists. They know that they want to just drum up trash and keep you down. But what does supposed Christians do? They vote for them. They lobby for them. Don't they realize this world has nothing for them? That philosophy that they are being taught is in 100% contradiction to the Word of God? Why would you even do that? I know a lot of Christians that will turn to a Dr. Spock or what this world has to say. I'm not going to spank my children. Oh, don't you see the scientific studies? You spank your children. And... You want to live like that? The Bible says you hate your child. Oh, no, I love them too much to discipline. No, the Bible says you don't discipline your child. You don't love him. Because you are not teaching them that there are consequences for their actions. Now, did I say abuse your children? Absolutely not. Did I say take sticks and slap your children? Absolutely not. Did I say take them, take them by the hair and slam them against the wall? Did I say kick them? Did I say punch them? Did I say poke them in the eyes? Did I say shove them in a bathtub? I didn't say anything like that. I said you discipline them the way God intended you to, in a controlled manner, in the right way, letting them understand that there's consequences for what they are doing. Right? There's a proper way to discipline, corporal discipline your child. Now, there's plenty of abuses to it. I understand that. And I'm not endorsing any abuse of a child. But you do need to discipline your child the right way and the correct way and not out of anger, not out of frustration, and not out of embarrassment. But you do it to train them in a loving way, though it may not seem too loving to them at the time. You're doing it because you love them. But there's going to be the world. What are they going to do? Can't do that. You spank your children, you're going to teach them to be mean, you're going to teach them to do this, you're going to teach them to do that. Oh, it doesn't work on my kid. My kid's the exception to the rule. Well, you'd be the first and only that's the exception to the rule because God's rules are perfect and support everything. You're going to reap what you sow. I mean, you could go on and on. I don't have to belittle this point. You understand. The world has nothing to do with Christ. He's getting ready to leave. The world's, the, the world's going to try and slaughter him. He's going he's gonna to be slaughtered, he's, but he's doing it to get victory over sin, over death in the grave. Jesus has the ultimate victory, but you can't physically sit down and talk to him. You can talk to him through his word. That's why I said this section is on the importance of God's word. Realize that there's a distinction between Satan and what he has to offer and what the word of God has to offer. All right? Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath Nothing. Absolutely nothing. There is not a blend. There is not a mix. This world has absolutely nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 31, he goes on, but that the world may know that I love the Father. This is interesting. Christ is going to display his love for the Father. He's going to show the world how he loves the Father. And how does he do this? He says, but the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. What? Well, what? What is this all about? 
Well, before the world was ever created, God knew the Father understood God, but the Father had a plan that he was going to send his son to die for the sins of the world. That's, that was his plan. He was going to display his love for us. Because we would not understand God's love if it were not for the Lord Jesus Christ. We would never understand God's love. That's what Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says. But God commendeth, or demonstrates what that word commendeth means, but God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the Son says, the world's going to know I love the Father because he had a commandment from the very beginning. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to do it. Satan's not going to deter me for it. I'm not going to be deterred from it. I'm not going to be tempted to do something else or any other way. I know what the Father's called me to do, and I'm going to go ahead and do it. And that's how the world knows that the Son loves the Father. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ says. So now let's look at it application-wise. How does this apply to me? Does the world know that you, love the lo that you love the Father? Are you doing what the Father has asked you to do? Are you living in submission to the Word of God and applying the Word of God to your life? Is that how you're displaying your love for the Father? That He has given you commandments? He's given you His Word? He's given you direction to the Holy Spirit of God? And now are you submitting to it? Or are you living in your own program? You're doing your own thing. You're doing what the world has to say and what the world has to offer. Which is it? The Lord Jesus Christ, this is how the world knows that I love the Father. Just as he gave me the commandment, I'm following through with the perfect will of God for my life, and I'm going to do exactly what the Father wanted me to do. And that leaves us to ask you that question. Are you doing it? Are you doing what the Lord's called you to do? Well, here's what the Lord tells you to do next. Arise. Let us go hence. Let us go from here. That's what hence means from here. He basically says, you know what? I'm ready to go. This is the night. Satan's hour is coming. It's going to get pretty black. I'm going to die. You guys are going to run away from me. Peter, you're going to deny me. I'm going to be betrayed. There's a lot of garbage going on tonight. But you know what? I'm all right with it. I got to do it. It was the Father's command. Time to do it. I can't just sit down. I can't just go to bed and say I'm too stressed out and I got to wait for all this, all this stuff to pass on and then I'll get up tomorrow and try and do it. No, let's arise. Let's do it. Hey, it's time. So the Father's called me to do it. Time for me to get up and do it. I can't just keep sitting back and doing nothing. Sitting back in sorrow. Sitting back and doing this. Back. The Lord's got me something to do. I'm going to do it. Arise. Let's go from here. I, I'm not going to accomplish the Lord's will. Sitting here fellowshipping and talking with you guys. Let's get up and let's get moving. I got to get to the place where I'm going to be betrayed. I got to get to the place where they're going to take me and beat me and murder me and slaughter me. I got something I got to do for this world. I got to do the Father's will. Let's arise and do it. He's made his command very clear. I'm not going to sit around and wait. Imagine if the Lord did that. Imagine if the Lord just said, you know what, I'm too stressed out, too much going on in my life, I'm just going to sleep this off, I'll get up tomorrow and handle it and try and handle it. Or let me go ahead and turn to drugs or alcohol for a night just to take all this pressure off me, and then, then tomorrow I'll try and go through it. You would never see the Lord do that. You would never see the Lord do that. He said, what passed in my life? That's why he tells you, stop being aggravated. Stop being agitated. Stop being troubled. Stop being fearful. Get your relationship with the Lord. Start rejoicing. This world's not your home. Yeah, it's ugly. Yeah, it's gross. Yeah, there's a lot of scary things out there. But this world's not your home. I've given you my word. You believe in me, believe in God. I've told you what this world's going to be like. I told you how they're going to treat you. I told you where the end result's going to be. You should already know that. So just prepare yourself for it. Get ready for it. Now, do what the Lord's called you to do. And don't sit there and rise. Get up. Start serving God today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for these truths that you've given us today, that we can have that peace, that we can, Father, rejoice, that we don't have to go around in fear, we don't have to be agitated, we don't have to be aggravated or stressed out. Father, we don't have to sit around and just do nothing either. You've called each and every person to do something. I don't know what it is. You're working in their hearts. You've given them the Holy Spirit. You're speaking to them through your word. I don't know what everybody's challenge is. I just know what mine are. And Father, you haven't just called me to sit around and do nothing. You said, arise. Let's get out of this place. Let's start moving. Let's start doing the will of God, the work of God. And Father, as things start beating us up and this world starts thrashing us, may we constantly look to you and realize this world is not our home. Matter of fact, like the Lord said, it has nothing 
to do with him. It has absolutely nothing. So Lord, if there are Christians that are comfortable in this world, voting like this world, acting like this world, just loving this world, may they realize that that has nothing to do with you. And that, Father, at the judgment seat of Christ, they are going to give an account for what they have done and how they've loved the world more than they loved your Son. Help us, Father, to trust your Word. Help it to grow in our belief. Like you said, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You've told us what's going to happen. You let us know. You build us up and, and, and strengthen us for the trials that are becoming in our lives. So, Father, I pray that we would stick close to your word, that we would listen to your word, and that we would obey it. Thank you again for all this chapter revealed to us of what you've done for us. All these things are things the world cannot offer. Father, help us take advantage of it. Help us to rejoice in it. Help it to apply to our lives. Father, please bless your people here today. And if there's someone here, maybe their life is so messed up, Lord, because they don't know your son as their Savior. They, didn't, they never trusted Jesus as their Savior. Maybe they've looked at this world and blamed you for it. May they realize that it's Satan, the prince and power of this world, the prince and power of the air that's in control of this world and all the filth and the garbage that's going on. It's not you. As a matter of fact, you've provided them a way out by showing your love, by sending your son to die for them where he left eternal glory to pay for their sins and to rise again. So Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't, or someone out there that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, may today be the day they repent of their sins and put their total trust and faith in your death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, we love you and thank you. Help us have a great day today. Thank you for your grace and provision, your peace, your safety, your joy, your comfort, all the things you give us. Father, help us to relish in those. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you. You have a great week. We'll see you Tuesday, if not sooner.